Well, welcome to this uh, episode, Andre. Um, before I ask you to introduce yourself a little bit to our audience, just to remind you, remind them that this is part of a series we started recently called Ministry of Future Affairs. And the idea was born out of uh, recognizing that while Armenia and Armenians think a lot about many aspects of things, future is really not something we focus on. And we wanted to showcase conversations with Armenians from all over the world who've been involved in Ar Armenian affairs and see if we can imagine the future a little bit together. And I know in the, since, since many 20 years plus, we've collaborated and I think you're an ideal guest for that. So introducing Andre Andonian uh, with a long career at McKinsey and Company. And it would be great if you start out just telling us a little bit about your, yourself maybe start with things that came before McKinsey, your upbringing, and then we'll talk about McKinsey and beyond. Very happy to do so, and thank you, Nubar, for taking the time to interview me. It's always a pleasure and honor spending time with you in whatever context. Um, so, I'm Andre Andonian was born in Vienna, Austria, um, as Austrian citizen, and both of my parents were of Armenian origin. They were from the Persian part of Armenia, they came to Austria, studied there, and I was first generation born there. When I was seven years old, I spent seven years in Tehran, because my father used to work for IBM, and he got an assignment there. So I attended the German school in Tehran, and then came back to Austria, where I finished my studies, and I'm an engineer in electronics. I have an international business degree from university in Vienna, University of Surrey and Universidad de Salamanca, and I have an MBA from the Wharton Business School, where I was a Fulbright Scholar. In my upbringing, my father was an engineer, also by background. I was very interested in engineering, so I started out working for IBM in different countries and was very intrigued uh, by solving you know, engineering problems. After a while, I realized, as a business person, I can perhaps add even more value and that's why I shifted towards business. But even after my graduation, I always focused uh, on solving problems that are engineering, industrial company oriented. And I led at McKinsey. I started McKinsey in Munich. And I went to the West Coast to go to the Mecca of high tech to get trained there. And then I came back and I um, led our high tech practice in Europe, Middle East, and Africa for McKinsey. Uh, later on, I formed the advanced industry sector, which was including automotive and assembly, and was asked to move to the US, where I was based in New York and in Connecticut, and led the advanced industry sector in Americas and globally. Later on, I was asked to lead our Japan office, which is the third largest economy worldwide, to revive it and revitalize it. And later on, the Korean office, and broader Asian responsibilities, looking at client impact and experience. Yeah. And throughout these times at McKinsey, it was overall 34 years. I was also the youngest member to join the global board of McKinsey in 2005. And I was, the last term I was there ended in 2020. And then I reached a term limit, because mm -hmm. at McKinsey you have to retire when you're 60. This happened in June this year. And I'm now a special advisor, senior partner emeritus to McKinsey. But at the same time, I have joined four profit boards and doing, continuing to do my pro bono work where Armenia has a big part of it. Super. What a, what a fantastic experience. Now, as you look back at that career, does it look anything like what you thought you were going to do when Not you were at, all. at college? <laughs> Not at all. Actually, if I, may, if I may say, I didn't even know what consulting is and I had never heard of McKinsey when I got an in uh, invitation when I was at Wharton to, uh, uh, to an interview. The professor, I remember, uh, told me you should go because if you get the job, they pay well and then you can decide whatever you want and you will get any interview afterwards. So that was my initial start, but I thought it's very interesting because my original thinking was I, want, I wanted always to work um, in a company that is international and is globally and where I can apply my expertise in, you know, in engineering and business together. So initially, I, was, I didn't know what consulting is. So I thought I start. Initially, I said I stay there for three years, so at least to become a project manager. And then I go, I move on. But then I was quite um, you know, intrigued by the variety of the assignments 
uh, different industries, different topics. The people I worked with, both on the client side and internally, and I stayed. And within McKinsey, I had multiple careers. So sure. every five years, I changed significantly my locations and what I've been doing. So since this is a program that really tries to get into actually how things happen, and I'm sure many of our audience members don't have a lot of experience with consulting either, and I know you've hired thousands and thousands of members of McKinsey and been involved in the hiring process. Um, what, what, how do you distill down what's the essence of a impactful consulting kind of a professional? Um, how would you describe it now that you've done it for so long? Yeah, so personally, I think it starts actually out with personal curiosity for new things because uh, you never reach a level where you say, I know it all. Once you think that, then you start declining. So always being open to new ideas, being curious um, is very important. Secondly, I think, um, is the personal connection. Uh, if we serve clients, these are human beings. Uh, so we have to understand their hopes, their fears, what drives them. And also, personally, you cannot solve a problem. You have to need a team around it. Mm -hmm. So I always say, um, Nobody is perfect, but a team can be perfect. Mm -hmm. So having the skill set to motivate and have the best team around you is a big success yeah. factor. And, and, and when you've done these, and maybe think of the toughest assignments you've had, and a company's fate is in a way dependent on what you're working on, they may make it, they may not. It's a little like being a doctor at some level, having to make a diagnosis, having to suggest a treatment. At the end of the day, how have you felt or how have you gotten yourself and the team comfortable that what you're saying is likely to succeed? Yeah, that's, I think what, this is one of the biggest, I would say, worries even I have. Are we actually recommending the right things? Is that the right cure? And would that create the best future for the company? Mm -hmm. And here, I would say, reaching out within McKinsey to the best experts, to really making sure we have the best experts in the field and having numerous, I would say, internal problem-solving sessions where we go through the fact base, through everything we know, and asking ourselves the tough question. And this was my experience, if I may say, early on at, uh, at McKinsey. I was assigned to one of the most uh, prominent automotive manufacturers, OEMs in Germany. And um, I thought I did a great job in doing the market segmentation and everything. And the client was excited about it, but I still was being questioned by the partners whether this is the right answer or not. So the quality bar at McKinsey we put on is usually higher than that of a client. And I say usually because I know that you yourself have an extremely high bar, so I wouldn't say that when I would be collaborating no. with you. <laughs> well, I mean, just, just for the audience to be aware, um, you know, within, within my sphere, within flagship, Pioneering and Moderna, we've had many, many points of interaction and collaboration with colleagues at McKinsey where they've provided expert input into many of our startup companies. You know, what we need is a very different thing often because it's not even a problem that we're trying to solve. It's that we're trying to create something that hasn't existed before. It's a different kind of, it's a conception problem and a scale problem, not a fixing problem. But nevertheless, it's been, as you described, kind of a you know, I think what helps is the rigorous planning analysis and options that your team has come up with, from which at the end of the day, a leader, a manager in a company and a team has to decide what to do. I mean, strategy is all about choice. And you know, when you're given a choice of one, it's really a tough thing to decide because you have no alternative. When you guys have done a good job of coming up with real choices and why one may be better than the other. So that's great. I wanna, I wanna just move on a little bit and before talking about the future, take you back some 22 years ago when we first started collaborating on an Armenian front, which was the Armenia 2020 project. You know, that, that involved a long journey, which continues today in various forms. Uh, but maybe take us back there before Armenia 2020. What was your relationship with the Armenian world? And tell us a little bit about that experience and how that's translated into integrating the Armenianness into your professional, not just your personal life. Yeah. So I was, as I mentioned, um, I was born to parents of Armenian origin and I was raised with um, 
great awareness of Armenia and Armenian culture. So I spoke Armenian at home. I was initially forced, but then I did it on, uh, you know, voluntarily to learn uh, to write and read Armenian. So I had initially my grandfather as my teacher. So I did the first six books, what you learn here, and all the stories about Hovannes Tumanian and all these things. Um, and in hindsight, I'm very grateful for that because that allowed me to understand who I am and uh, what, you know, what rich heritage uh, I think the Armenian culture has. And uh, so with that, I would, and my, my parents both were very, uh, you know, Armenian lovers in the sense. So my father was uh, at one point leading the AGBU in Austria. He was organizing trips to Armenia to show to non-Armenians actually how Armenia looks like. So with that, I had always, I would say, a positive relationship. But um, um, I think when I was contacted actually by you and Ruben in 2002 about Armenia 2020, that was a turning point for me because that's where I became from a participant or being an Armenian to somebody who saw the opportunity I can actually contribute to Armenia directly. And until then, I personally had not been to Armenia, to our homeland Armenia. And this created actually the good excuse to be here. And I still remember the first time I came here. Uh, and I had read about Yerevan. I had seen all the pictures that my father had shown about the trips. But it's something else to be there yourself. And to see people, when you walk on the street, all speak Armenian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you go to a restaurant, you get the same food that you get at home, basically. So for me, it was a great experience. And honestly, by looking at the people here in Armenia, I thought, if I don't help, who would help? So I basically defined my social contributions. I said, in life, it's going to be Armenia and Armenia-oriented. And uh, since then, I have to say, I've been involved in numerous initiatives, both pro bono in all type of forms, and have also tried to develop the network of Armenians outside Armenia. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity, Nubar. Yeah, no, we've had a great time. So maybe, maybe for the audience, kind of maybe reflect back at the first, you know, five, six, seven years of Armenia 2020 and what that was about for you at a high level, and then maybe connect it to the present and, and you know, 15 years later, what trans transpired, and then we can talk about the future. Yeah. So I think initially I was struck by, I would say, the rich culture here. <laughs> and also by the kindness of the people. Uh, but at the same time, I saw the challenges that Armenia is facing as a small country with uh, perhaps neighbors that are not so friendly, uh, landlocked. And um, the question is, how can we help to the prosperity of the people here? And that's where we spend a lot of time actually together in Armenia 2020 to see whether what are potential scenarios and which are the attractive scenarios for the future? Mm -hmm. What can we imagine? for Armenia and deri deriving from their actions that have, have to be taken uh, in order to get there. And this was quite eye-opening for me because I also started to learn how can you build nations and how can you actually have impact on nations, not only on companies but on nations. So that was a great personal journey also for myself. Mm -hmm. And my take was already at that time that Armenia has a huge opportunity because uh, the human capital we have, the talent base we have uh, is, I would say, world class and in the region standing out. And the question is, how can we get alignment and how can we create a um, vision that is shared by many so all the energy and all the forces that are here actually are pushing in the, in the same direction mm -hmm. and not partly in opposite direction of setting each other. So that was one of my big learnings. How can you do that? Uh, secondly, the, the, I would say the breadth of the outcomes is huge. So you could be, I mean, at that time we had a Singapore-based scenario and a Syria scenario. And if you look at that and what does it mean for the people in the country, it's a huge difference in terms of GDP per capita, but also in terms of the pride they feel, uh, the opportunities they have in life. So uh, I think, therefore, it's even more fundamental than changing the faith of a company to try to change the faith of a nation and to uh, try to have influence. Mm -hmm. And this was also something I yeah. learned to appreciate. And lastly, 
to how do you, do you, you need many stakeholders in order to make that happen. And it's both government, non-government, in Armenia, outside Armenia, Armenians, non-Armenians, companies, and, and so on, you can go on. And the question is how can we create a momentum where we can um, collaborate uh, towards the same objective among all stakeholders. So now we have um, more recently been uh, focusing on collaborating in the context of Armenia 2041 and that date was selected because that's the 50th, and that would be the 50th anniversary of Armenia's declaration of an, of an independent republic. And the question is, what is possible in the next 20 years? And importantly, there's some new challenges, obviously security challenges, sovereignty challenges. Um, the economic opportunities continue to be there. Um, and I know that, that you and your McKinsey colleagues did some work last year in this direction. At a summary level, how do you see those future choices today? Yeah. So I first of all say Armenia has done actually good progress until 2020. So if we look at our scenario thinking, we ended up on the positive side. Having said that, the world at that time has also been more positive than we all were thinking. It was a growth stage in the world. So perhaps we could have done even better, in my opinion. We could have done even better. So I see a bit of missed opportunities. And now looking ahead, I see short-term challenges. I mean, given the geopolitics, you know, the deglobalization, decarbonization, demographic challenges, uh, disruption of technology. Um, there are sort of macro challenges, but also micro challenges in Armenia. Uh, but I see them all uh, in a way that Armenia can overcome if we take the right actions. And uh, there, there, I think the size of Armenia being a smaller country helps because we can be more nimble and we can actually uh, defeat, if you want, global trends in a sense because we are a smaller, smaller country. And I personally think we, have, we could have a bright future in 2041. The key success factors, and I would ask the audience to look at the report because I think a major part of it is public anyway, is again, I think, reminding ourselves we cannot do everything at the same time. So focus is important. Starts with which segments we focus on, like do we go for tourism, IT, to give some examples. Um, secondly, talent is important. So really, I think it starts with high school, university, and vocational uh, talent. So really making sure that is happening. Uh, thirdly, it has to be attractive also for non-Armenians to do business in Armenia. Mm -hmm. So it could be foreign direct investments. It could be the NGOs and others. I think that's important. And the fourth one, I would say, being prudent, how we make the choices that impact us uh, with our neighbors. Because I'm personally in favor of, I would say, a sustainable peace, if I may say, in a way that works for everybody. That's better than having, you know, a war going on forever, because it makes, I think, everybody weaker at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the day. And I personally think, for instance, uh, Nubar, I very much applaud the things you are leading and also how you founded, the, um, uh, together with others, uh, our Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology. And we are here talking, actually, as part of the Global Innovation Forum. Mm -hmm. This is a great uh, example how we can bring, actually, not only Armenians, but other, I would say, great experts worldwide and leaders, scientists, mm -hmm. to Armenia and try to learn from them but at the same time excite them so they see Armenia as an opportunity also for themselves. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, and there's so much to, to, to cover even on that topic. But I think one of the things you touched on, and it's been a constant struggle for us, obviously, for 20 years, is that there really is this unlimited uh, resource base uh, of Armenians um, outside of Armenia who have a special affinity for wanting the future of Armenia to be bright. Uh, and it proves difficult to get that, those kind of uh, resources applied to Armenia uh, more than just as tourists or investors, but rather people who contribute their most prized uh, 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 assets, which is their reputation, their connections, and their time. And we tend to undervalue that often here uh, in exchange for money that's more fungible or just expenditure. Uh, consumption, which is also more fungible. 
So that, that's for another day to discuss, but I think that's underlying a lot of what you're saying and will keep us busy for the next 20 years trying to figure out how to do that because I think we've probably uh, done some things there, but there's so much more to do and I'm hoping part of what the audience takes away today is to want to be sitting in our chairs and be so actively involved as that you can actually think about giving advice to people about how to think about it. So on that end, uh, there will be young folks early in their careers getting education, thinking ahead and thinking, well, how does this all relate to me? And if they could each get a minute with you to get your advice, uh, you would have to spend thousands of hours doing that. But you now have a couple of minutes to give them directly advice as to, you know, if they're the next Andre Andonian or Anush Andonian or, you know, the next, the next decades of investment in both excellence in the world but also contribution to Armenia, how should they think about it at a young age? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question and I have two daughters myself and I try to give the similar counsel to them. Um, so I think that everything starts with aspirations, personal aspirations. Who do you want to be? And uh, they, this has to be high. I think it doesn't matter what it is, but it has to be a high aspiration because if the aspiration is not high, you simply are going to you know, not use the time, you're not going to develop and so on. And pick the aspiration around an area that really matters to you and you feel excited about. Because it's very, it usually takes longer time to reach it and if it's not something that excites you, you will lose interest, you will lose energy or you will give up if there is the first obstacle. So that starts with that and I think as Armenia we have a great tradition of, you know, artists, uh, um, businessmen, uh, uh, inventors and so on. So it could be a very broad field. Mm -hmm. Just be very clear on that. And if you think it's difficult and you have multiple, just start exploring different aspects of it so you can narrow it down after, after a while. So it's good to have an aspiration. That's very important. Secondly is to think about how am I going to get there? And usually it means you need the support from others because alone you cannot do it. And the question is, how do you ask for support? And my experience has been very positive because people are always willing to help if you ask them in the right way and if you also put yourself in their shoes and say, how could it be a bit as a win-win win in the sense? If they would support, what is it what they will get out of it? And the one thing people always like is you know, uh, satisfaction of having helped somebody is already a big, mm -hmm. big driver. So I would say that's second, so just be clear what is it what you have to do to reach your aspirations? Thirdly, I think it's the mindset question because never it will work, uh, it's never a straight line and, with it, and it will be you know, difficult along the way, setbacks along the way. So you have to be resilient and you have to remind for yourself why are you doing that and you have to uh, actually be clear with your ener personal energies um, how can you restore your energies so you can continue doing that? I would say that's the third thing. Uh, the fourth thing is you need a sounding board around you. People who you respect, but also people who care for you, who give you continuous feedback, mm -hmm. how you're doing. Because I call it always tough love or however you want to call that. You always need feedback because uh, I think initially not even unintentionally, you may be doing things that are less productive, less good, and those people will tell you, you should do this that way and that way. So that's, I think, important. And the last one is just build a personal network of colleagues who share similar aspirations uh, so you're not alone, and together you can go after it. All great, all great input, and then keep the Armenian future in mind, because at the end of the day, whether you're in Australia or in your Alaska or you're in... Rio de Janeiro, wherever you are as an Armenian, it's part of what makes you special. As you said, that's what kind of got you thinking about the Armenian direction. It's who, it's who you are, it's what defined you. And then a more, a brighter, more prosperous, more secure Armenia means Armenians all around the world have actually accomplished something if they participated in it. So I think that's always a good goal as well. Well, look, we're short on time. I appreciate all the time you devoted to this and it was a great discussion. Thanks and uh, we'll look forward to adding to this series with exciting such discussions going forward. Thank you, Andre. Yes, thank you, Nubal. Thank you very much. Great pleasure.